Thank you very much for joining us today. You are uh, present for uh, the Rady MBA program's first masterclass of 2022. Um, the masterclass series is designed to give interested candidates like yourself and possibly um, you know, upcoming students a view into what we are, um, what we really stand for. You'll get a sense of our culture. And most importantly, you will meet one of our esteemed professors and be able to take a mini class and, and get a sense of what it's really like to be in an MBA class and also, um, you know, again, realize the uh, tremendous uh, luck we have with these amazing professors here that you will also be able to learn from should you come to Rady. So before we get started, my name is Christina Cook. I'm Assistant Director of Graduate Admissions here at Rady. Um, this presentation is going to last about 45 minutes. And if you have questions um, throughout, you know, along, along the way, please feel free to write them in the chat function. Um, and at the end, we'll have more questions, more time for questions and answers where you can actually raise your hand. Um, and if you'd like to schedule a personal advising session, if any of this sounds exciting to you and you're already turned on, you can contact me if you're interested in one of the Flex MBA programs, or you can contact my colleague, um, Gerard Banales, who he is in charge of the full-time programs, and both of our emails are here. So before we do get started, I do want to say a little bit about the Rady mission. Um, the Rady School of Management advances business by generating meaningful research and educating principal innovative leaders. It is core to who we are, and that is what we take very seriously. For our students that come to Rady, we really want them to leave with a sense of community and a sense of um, collaboration and really understanding what it means to be a leader in, you know, in the business community. A little bit more about Rady. We are, you know, most of you are here for the MBA program, but we do have other master's programs in the college. Um, we have a master's in business analytics, both full-time and weekend, master's of professional accountancy, master's of finance, and of course our PhD programs. And at, you know, at, at Rady, and you've probably heard a lot about this, we are STEM-based and business is a science as far as we're concerned. Um, we believe in the power of rigorous discovery we experiment and test business ideas from every angle. Our programs are intensely hands-on, they're innovative, and they're inspired by cutting edge um, research of our faculty, which you will, oops, let me go back there. You'll be able to see, yeah, sorry about that. Um, and again, our programs are STEM designated, which reflects the analytical and data-driven focus of what we do here. We're a small number of, um, small number of business schools, particularly in Southern California that have this designation. And um, you know you will ultimately have more of a market market uh, marketability. Excuse me, when you go out into looking for your job, because the world is now about technology, and that's what we do best here. Um, so we will take your quantitative and analytical skill set to a new level. You will leave with a very solid set of skills, understanding the inter intersection between science, data, and innovation. And most importantly, what you're going to see today, you're going to um, learn a little bit about our faculty. We have some of the most exciting scholars in the world working for us. They're experts in their field. They've trained and, they, they've trained and they teach at top business schools. Um, they're dedicated teachers. They're open door policy. They wanna make sure that you can make the connection between business and analytical thinking. Um, they make an impact in our world, just like we hope you do. And right, right now, for instance, we have faculty are studying COVID and how it's affecting our mental health, um, how party affiliation is affecting the stock market, and how online product displays can shape consumer buying behavior. So these are just some of the things that you will learn should you come to Rady. Um, and it's all relevant, as you can see. It's, all, it's things that we deal with every day in our daily lives. So a little bit about us. Now we're gonna get the show going with Dr. Ken Wilber. Today's master class is entitled, How to Be Good at Marketing. And Dr. Ken Wilber has been with Rady since 2013, I believe. He is known as um, one of the most prominent marketing scholars in the world. He's consulted with organizations such as Google, the National Collaboration of Gun Violence and Research, Yahoo and others. He is the associate editor for the Journal of Marketing Research. He's on the re editorial review boards of Marketing Science, Journal of Marketing, and Marketing Letters. And he is co-editor of the information, the journal Information Economics and Policy. Um, he also was, he was consulted for what the New York Times considered the antitrust case of the decade, which was U.S., United States of America versus AT&T. Uh, he has taught both at Duke University and the University of Southern California. 
Um, he worked as a software engineer prior to pursuing his PhD, and he received his PhD at University of Virginia. So um, I could continue to go on, but I'd like to share, uh, like have you have you share time with him. So I'm going to let Dr. Wilber take over now. So thank you very much. Thanks, Christina. That that was very generous. Um, you you know you're getting old when your bio takes more than a couple minutes. <laughs> um, so uh, well, very accomplished. <laughs> um, I used to teach the core marketing class, which every MBA student takes at Rady. And I taught intro to marketing analytics, which every MSBA student takes. Um, they're really fun classes. I stepped out of that role a couple years ago when we hired Uma Karmarkar, who had been teaching the core marketing class at Harvard. So she was interested in continuing to teach the same class. So I thought, well, Uma was at Harvard. That's gotta be good for the students. And I thought I was nerdy for having a PhD. Uma has two PhDs. So I said, okay. Um, I, and I, I, I now teach e-commerce and customer analytics. But what I'm gonna do for you here today is um, a condensed version of what used to be the first hour of core marketing. And um, so this is both a good sample of the type of class content that you get at Rady, as well as uh, not cannibalizing anything um, uh, if you were to come here. So um, I've asked hundreds of audiences, uh, what's marketing? And I uh, typically get um, three responses. Um, about 40% of, uh, of, of my respondents say marketing is advertising. About 40% say marketing is sales. And about 40, uh, not 40, but the remaining 20% uh, give me an, an impolite word. Um, uh, 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 indicating um, uh, general absence of truth. And, um, the, the modern meaning of marketing has uh, changed um, from the original meaning. And unfortunately, we don't have a modern word which replaces the original term. So um, we're gonna talk about what marketing is, why so few people actually have an accurate view of the topic, uh, what marketers do, and both how to be good at marketing and how to identify what skill sets you individually may need to develop in order to improve at this critical skill. So um, I like to start with my, my favorite example of great marketing, and that is bagged lettuce. Now, Bagged lettuce started getting popular uh, around the time I was uh, the age of, of most of the people on this call. Um, when I was a kid, uh, the grocery store didn't sell bags of lettuce. And uh, now they're in uh, virtually every grocery store you might walk into. Now, why is this an example of great marketing? So think about it. Um, who does bagged lettuce appeal to the most? probably somebody who needs to prepare dinner for a group of people, maybe their family, probably somebody who is short on time and just wants to save a little bit of time and, and willing to pay a premium to get uh, that healthy uh, element into the meal that they're preparing. Now, the surprising thing, if you haven't thought about it before, is that while the grocery store sells bags of lettuce, they also sell heads of lettuce. And uh, that by itself is not surprising. What, what could be surprising is, is the price difference between those two products. So one bag of lettuce typically goes for around $2.50. Of course, it depends on the store you go. Um, uh, a head of lettuce typically goes for about $1.60. And you can typically get about two bags worth of lettuce out of one head of lettuce. 
So if you buy the head of lettuce, you take it home, wash it, chop it up, you pay it $1.60, and it takes about three minutes to wash and chop one head of lettuce. And you got an equivalent amount of lettuce to two bags of lettuce for which you could have paid $5. Or if you're going to Whole Foods, maybe that costs you $10. But, but let's just go with the typical prices. That means that you are effectively paying $3.40 to avoid the hassle and the energy and the time of washing and chopping a head of lettuce. Now, since it takes about three minutes to do that, and I've timed this, I've gone to a bunch of different grocery stores around town. This, this is a, a fun topic for a marketing nerd like me. Um, so, so what hourly rate are you paying to avoid washing and chopping your own lettuce? Well, it's, it's $3.40 to save th about three minutes. So that's about $68 per hour to avoid a simple household chore that you can easily perform yourself. Now, um, a lot of people haven't run that calculation before. Uh, and this is not the only um, step in the process, right? Maybe by, um, maybe by, by paying that premium to save that little bit of time, they have those three minutes to do something else like making sure the kids wash their hands or, or assembling the other ingredients for the salad uh, in order to get something green on the table. Or uh, you know maybe they uh, they value the extra um, ingredients that come like this purple looks like cabbage in this uh, bag of seven lettuces. Um, but the point being that um, somebody figured out that it would both be phenomenally valuable as well as phenomenally profitable to help the consumer save a couple steps in their dinner preparation. And as a result, this product is one of the highest margin products available in most grocery stores. And this is generally true for, for cut, washed and cut produce. You're, you're paying a large premium when, when you buy that as opposed to the same thing um, in, in the slightly raw form uh, you know, down the aisle. So, so the reason I think it's a, it's a great example of marketing, one of my favorites is that it's, it's valuable to the customer. It's very valuable to the firm that offers it. And like many examples of great marketing, this is practically invisible. You, you, you really have to be sort of a marketing expert to, to notice the, the quality of the marketing in, in this example. Now, the word market, the word marketing came from the necessity for new products to have markets available to purchase them in order for them to be profitable. New product development is generally the largest fixed cost that any firm incurs. And what frequently happened when the field of marketing first emerged as sort of a fusion between economics and psychology and still happens today is that engineers would identify real problems in the world. They would come up with good solutions to those problems. The firm would commercialize the solutions and then no one would buy them. This happened repeatedly. And so the idea behind marketing was to make sure that if we're gonna to go to the trouble to offer this product, that there will be a group of people or organizations that will be willing to compensate us so that we make a return on our sunk uh, development cost. Now, uh, more recently, you might wonder if this is still the case. Um, it absolutely is. Uh, so Y Combinator is um, a, a very famous uh, startup uh, investment and incubator uh, in uh, the Bay Area. And the, the president, and they received tens of thousands of applications from startup founders to be included in their programs. And, and the president of uh, the organization said um, the number one thing they see wrong with the startup applications they receive is that the founders are focused on the solution rather than thinking about the problem and the market before they develop the solution. And, and so the, the very pithy, beautifully phrased um, advice it gives is make something people want. Make sure people want the thing you're making before you go to the trouble to make it or before you ask me to buy part of your company to help fund you making that thing. And independent of Y Combinator, 
there have been a number of analyses of startup postmortems. These are fascinating documents. If you've never read one, I, I highly recommend it. When a when a startup launches, most startups are are um, not successful in the end, and they often uh, burn um, quite a bit of money uh, before they realize that outcome. And the the founders often um, borrow that money from friends and family before they approach the the professional investment community. And so so when a startup unfortunately, regrettably, goes belly up. Um, the, the founder is in a situation where they, they often have to explain to, to some of their closest relationships in the world uh, why uh, their investments were, were not productive. And, and one way to, to lower that cost is to, to, to write a document to share with people before, before initiating those conversations. And these documents often become public, whether the founder posts it on social media or or whether one of the recipients uh, shares it. And so there are archives of startup postmortems. The, the, the one I'm pointing to here um, asked the question, um, what were the, the major problems identified by founders of bankrupt startups uh, as having caused those bankruptcies? And um, I, I'd say this is about uh, 12 out of the top 15-ish. Uh, are what I would think of as marketing problems. So number one, by, by far, is, is no market need. Um, number two is ran out of cash. Why is that a marketing problem? Because um, if you had a market for your product and you were successful in demonstrating the value, you would have enough money coming in to keep the lights on. And the, the only group of students who have, I've never heard them question the value of marketing is people who have founded companies before. And I, I think part of the reason that so many people misperceive marketing as, as um, being advertising or sales is um, they've worked in large organizations. Now, uh, marketing is really a, a full process of understanding the problems, desires, wants, needs, and perceptions, uh, as well as constraints, decision-making criteria, um, and, and other aspects of, of consumers. And that often involves psychology if we're understanding individual buyers or organizational psychology when, when we're selling into businesses, governments, nonprofits, or, or other organizations of people. So understanding what problems they're experiencing, how they currently solve those problems, how they could solve those problems, how we could help them solve those problems uh, in a way that's uh, better, cheaper, perhaps more efficiently, um, provi perhaps providing uh, additional benefits. Then also thinking about how competitors, both current and future, might be able to either copy what we're doing, iterate on what we're doing, or um, you know we're looking for a sustainable uh, value proposition relative to long-term competition. And then we have to be able to extract enough value from the transaction that it's profitable for us uh, to, to offer um, these products or services that we have to make sure the customer can understand uh, what we're offering, make sure they know about us, make sure they can um, afford us and make sure they can find us in, in an economical way. And, the, the way these decisions often, not always, but very often get made is when an enterprise is first set up, the most important marketing decisions are made by the founders, the very first employees of the organization. And then they are, they're, they're often never changed again after that because uh, altering them is often perceived as very risky. And so the, what's called the marketing department within most business to consumer companies is really a marketing communication department which runs advertising or something like it. And this is an important function, but it's not the, it's not the original, it's not the most critical. It, it really depends upon the value proposition the company is offering because if you have a bad product, you can throw all the ads at it you want. Not many people are going to buy it. 
Now, people coming out of uh, organizations that sell into businesses, governments, and nonprofits, they often think of marketing as sales. Advertising is typically uh, not an economical solution when you're selling to a limited number of large organizations. And so personal selling is a, a tactic that's taken much more frequently. You're often customizing the terms of the product or service given the individual customer's needs. And, um, and, and so it, it's more of a human process. And so people coming out of B2B, they think of marketing as sales because that's how their firms get, get business. But again, without a great sustainable value proposition, you can throw all the salespeople you want at it, you're, you're not gonna sell a lot of units. And so uh, this to me is um, the most likely explanation why so many people misperceive what marketing is, along with the fact that great marketing is often invisible, whereas, whereas bad marketing will, you know, it, it, it's hard to miss. So um, there are, uh, so marketing has splintered. Um, there are typically dozens of marketing roles within the firm and hundreds outside the firm. And as a result, um, the people who have sort of the bird's eye view on marketing, they're often at, at the top of the organization. I've, I've seen estimates that around two thirds of boards of directors time are, are spent discussing fundamental marketing issues like how do we retain this key customer? Should we enter that foreign market? Our competitor has introduced a new product. How do we respond? And so unless you're, you're at the very top of the organization, it, it, it's often, you're often not involved in, in these discussions. Um, so I think that's probably a, a good moment to uh, pause for a breath. Um, uh, I, looks like we have a couple of things in the uh, chat. So promoting a product and creating need for it in the audience is um, Pretty good, pretty good. I'd say partial definition of marketing, getting toward it. Um, and uh, um, we're gonna close out with um, five skills that uh, I believe based on my um, personal experience and observations to be critical to be good at marketing. And um, most people have uh, some of these skills and, and it's really uh, very few people I've met in my lifetime that are sort of naturally good at all five skills, but all five of them are, are things that you can develop if you uh, make a conscious effort to do so. So um, the, the first skill I'll argue we need to be good at marketing is empathy. Now, uh, empathy is the ability to put yourself into someone else's shoes and um, uh, accurately um, simulate their experience. And the reason this is important is because um, typically when we work in an industry or a market, we become, we quickly become uh, objective experts in the market. We, we understand the, the relevant attributes. We, we know how to measure quality. We, we know the history of um, the industry. And, and because we become experts, and typically our customers never will be experts, that means we cannot rely on our own internal perceptions or beliefs or attitudes to predict how our customers view the same phenomena. Um, an example of this is uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jamie Sawhill. Uh, he, he lectures at uh, WashU in St. Louis. He, he did a PhD in marketing at Berkeley. And his dissertation was about um, uh, what factors predict consumers' choice of cat food flavor? Uh, which is such a, a weird but beautiful question when you think about it, right? So, so you have this uh, little fur ball and um, you, you feed it every day and um, you can choose within every brand, you have the basic flavors, right? Do I wanna uh, give fluffy chicken, um, salmon, uh, steak, whatever it might be. And, and do you know the, the best predictor of what flavor people buy for their cat? it's the type of food they buy for themselves. So if you tend to buy more chicken than average, you tend to buy chicken flavored cat food. If you tend to buy more salmon than average, you tend to buy salmon flavored cat food. And, and so it's, um, 
th this has been um, shown experimentally in other contexts that when people try to make predictions about how others uh, view the world, they start from their own internal reference points. Psychologists call this the availability heuristic uh, on, on the idea that what I have available when I'm filling in the gap of what's inside that person's head is what's inside my own head. I'm a reasonable person. They're probably a reasonable person. We probably think alike. In, in fact, um, that's often mistaken. And so um, we, we, uh, we, we have an entire discipline called marketing research to understand how customers uh, view the market. So the second thing I'm gonna argue you need to be great at marketing is creativity. Now, um, people in, um, in business often uh, mistake what we're talking about here. They, they think creativity means I need to paint a beautiful painting or uh, compose a novel or a song or, or, or something like that. And um, in business, that's not really the, the relevant form of creativity we're considering. Creativity is taking two or a handful of concepts and combining them in a new and useful way. My, my favorite example of all time is vitamin water. Introduced in 1998, sold to Coca-Cola in 2002 for $500 million. Water, it's pretty popular. <laughs> a lot of people drink water. Uh, vitamins, pretty popular. A lot of people take vitamins. Do you know what they take their vitamins with? Water. Uh, put those two things together. What's the major ingredient? High fructose corn syrup. <laughs> and yeah, until 1998, there was no product called vitamin water. Beautiful example of creativity in business, phenomenally profitable. Um, Okay, uh, empathy, creativity, we're talking about very uh, artistic, um, uh, perhaps right brain types of concepts. Uh, the, the third um, attribute I believe you need to be great at marketing is you need to be both um, willing and able to sit down and do some basic math. Um, we cannot figure out whether a value proposition is both attractive for the customer and attractive for us without being willing and able to do some basic marketing math. Um, so, so we need both. Great marketing requires both. We cannot maximize the value for the customer because we have opposite incentives in terms of price. The more value we give the customer, the less contribution margin we have to sustain the enterprise and reward our shareholders. And so we have to collaborate with the customer to create value, but then we also have to extract an appropriate amount of value for the enterprise. Now, um, there are lots of um, examples of, of great marketers uh, or um, consumer focused marketers who did not do the math on particular marketing plans. Um, one famous example uh, was called the American Airlines Air Pass. Um, they decided to sell lifetime unlimited first class travel for a single one-time fixed fee. And originally they priced that service at a quarter million dollars. And a um, quarter million dollars might sound like a lot of money and for the typical person it absolutely is. Um, but when you think about free first class travel for the rest of your life, anywhere American Airlines flies, including international destinations, you can quickly see that it would pay to borrow a quarter million dollars and buy that product on the spot. And um, uh, they sold out very quickly. Uh, one guy would fly from New York City to Buffalo in first class every single day just to get the free sandwich for lunch. Uh, another person took 16 round, uh, 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 round trip flights between New York and London in a single 25 day span. Um, ultimately, uh, American had to end up suing uh, some of their best customers. Um, and, and so it, it was a, just a PR nightmare for the brand to get out of this. Um, 
so so the math that we do in marketing it, it tends to be pretty simple we i gave you an example um on thinking about the value proposition of the bag of lettuce um uh but there is an art to knowing um what to do uh how to apply it and then the most important is um figuring out when we can't get the the actual data that would best inform our our decisions um what assumptions to make uh, and and how sensitive are the conclusions to those assumptions? And so an example of that, I filled in for you. Um, well, when I've bought a head of lettuce and I wash it and chop it, it takes about three minutes on average. Okay, what if, what what? How does that distribution look across consumers? And and then how do, how does an individual's willingness to pay co-vary with the time it takes them to to wash and chop? There's a bunch of little wrinkles here that um, that are. Uh, uh, interesting and sometimes time consuming to figure out. And we spend most of our time trying to nail down the assumptions just right. Um, the, the fourth attribute that I'm gonna argue is critical for being great at marketing is, is um, tolerating ambiguity. So, um, you know, it, it, uh, to, to maintain a strong degree of confidence in a lifetime of practicing marketing requires either a, a very high um, self-regard or um, uh, a willingness to, to ignore mistakes. Um, it, it's really, really hard to tell in a given situation before you take any actions, what the best path will be. So um, let's look at sort of an extreme example of this. Uh, when, I was, um, when I was in college in the 90s, uh, Apple was on the ropes. They had less than a 2% share of the desktop market. And that was the only computer market, uh, consumer computer market that existed. There, there was no mobile or laptop or tablet. And, and as most of you saw on social media, they're, they're now the most valuable public company ever uh, by a long shot. Um, and, and so if you look over the past 20 to 25 years, what accounted for this incredibly dramatic reversal of fortunes for, for Apple? Was it, was it their early embrace of the internet? Was it their, um, their focus on uh, uh, innovative design? Was it their seamless integration across software and hardware? Was it, to what degree was it the, the new form factors they, they brought out? Um, there are people who have spent their career on trying to figure this out and, and there is no general agreement on which subset of factors alone or in combination is really the best explanation for why this occurred. And there are even former Apple executives who have given different accounts of the same set of events. So, so in general, in marketing, um, there are a lot of um, difficult questions we need to think about. And if I boil them down as much as I possibly can, I get them down to these nine questions. So uh, what customer need are we gonna try to serve? What are the differences in those needs across people who might buy from us? Which group of people or organizations should we try to serve? How do we understand how they see the market, both our offering and competitors? How can we address their needs? Um, what else can we do for them? How do we explain what we're offering? How do we get our product or service uh, to them? Are we selling direct? Are we going through intermediaries like retailers uh, or others? Um, and then how much and, and what structure do we use on pricing? So, so imagine it were this simple, right? Just these nine questions, which in fact, it's not nearly this simple, but, but suppose it were, Let's, let's use this as a model. And, and suppose rather than these being open-ended questions, suppose um, someone came down from heaven and suppose they simplified that for you and made, each, made it a multiple choice uh, quiz uh, with five possible answers for each question. So um, there would be five to the power nine possible marketing plans, even when the, within this incredibly simplified environment. So that means around almost 2 million plans that, that we could um, put forward and, and run with. Way too many to test. There, there's lots of opportunities within marketing to do A-B testing or multi-arm bandits or, or to take advantage of data to improve our decision-making. But for the, for the big picture questions, um, 
we, we typically don't get uh, great benefit from existing data to help us decide how to do something new or better. So um, what we end up doing is, um, you know, to, to learn a skill in a space where, where the problem space is much, much broader than the space of solutions that could be tested. We, we usually take a mixture of um, uh, case-based reasoning and um, empirical research and practice. So there are, other, um, there are other professions that use similar methods of training, uh, law, medicine, nursing uh, are a couple that come to mind. So in, in, say you're a general practitioner, somebody walks into your office, they have uh, symptom A, symptom B, and symptom C. From that, you can identify a large set of diseases that they might have. You have to figure out what other diagnostics to run and how certain you need to be before you decide on a course of action. So, so it's a mixture of, of cases and empirical research to produce generalizations and, and, and practice. So in general, we're gonna be able to know if we succeed people to do is to ask, when you hear people giving marketing advice um, there's a lot of people out there giving a lot of advice on different aspects of, of this discipline um, just always keep in the back of your head how do you know this thing that you're saying is true and um, you know this is this is generally a, a powerful question um, you know if, if you're having an argument with your spouse or, or uh, you're, you're, you heard something from your kid that, that you think might not be right how do you know what you know and, um, and it often helps you to, to move toward uh, both like a, a, a respectful dialogue, a, a resolution, um, or, or often helps to identify the, the key question mark that you need um, that, that might be missing before you're confident in a given conclusion. And, and so to me, this is um, the value of uh, Rady's focus on uh, scientific research to inform as many decisions as, as possible. And, and by the way, remember, um, uh, I, I've argued that to be great at marketing, you have to be um, willing to do the math and, and you also have to tolerate ambiguity. Uh, I don't know if you guys can hear that, <laughs> yikes. Um, uh, normally I would be in my office. Uh, there's a coffee shop next door in this co-working space where I'm sitting at the moment, but thank you for bearing with me. Um, and th there'll probably be like a train horn in a minute. Um, and, and so, as you can see, uh, you know, there, there's not too many people that, that are naturally great at this combination of skills. Um, the, the, fifth, uh, the fifth attribute I'll argue you need to be great at marketing is, is you, you have to be humble. Um, unfortunately, for, for the marketing practitioner, uh, bad marketing is really obvious to a lot of people. And, and that's where this negative modern connotation of the word comes from. Uh, but great marketing is practically invisible and has many, um, ha, ha, you know, many people claim credit for the success within the firm. Now, if you're phenomenally successful, you know who takes credit for your work? It's your customer. H have you ever heard someone say, oh my God, I found this great little Thai restaurant in my neighborhood last night. I found that restaurant, right? Never mind the, the entrepreneur figured out the right cuisine at the right price point with the right mix of dishes and the right design and, and maybe you know got onto the right uh, social media or mapping services and, and the right location. And, and you know if it's a good fit for me, I claim the credit. And that's a phenomenal success for that restaurant um, when they serve their customer well enough that, that the customer takes credit for the service. Um, so, you know, this, you can develop um, each of these skills. Uh, what I encourage uh, people to do is to um, be honest, self-assess. Where are you strong? Where are you weak? And then create a plan on um, how to develop those weaknesses into um, uh, further strengths to, to sort of improve your overall package. Now, I, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I haven't checked. Um, oh, 1244. 
I have a minute left or more if Christina wants um, to, to get into questions or uh, to, to go anywhere else. What do you think, Christina? You're able to stay and if, if candidates and, and you know, participants would like to, um, you know, an extra five, 10 minutes would be great. If you're unable, then we can certainly wrap it up. Uh, that sounds good. Um, I'm clear to one. Uh, so um, if, uh, if you have another obligation, um, thank you so much for coming. Um, and if you want to stick around for another five, 10 minutes, I'm, I'm happy to stay up to 1255 to, um, take questions in the, in the chat. Um, and, uh, how do you suggest building empathy? That is one of my favorite questions. I have three suggestions. I'll try to make them brief. Uh, first way to build empathy, um, have a baby. You have this, um, uh, little bundle of joy that ha is entirely dependent on you um, for fulfilling their basic needs and um, has a very uh, um, uh, imprecise signals to inform you about what those needs are and how well you're su succeeding in fulfilling them. Um, if you don't wanna take such an extreme step or maybe not just yet, uh, there, there are some other approaches that work. Um, my, my second best advice would be um, uh, volunteering with face-to-face um, uh, -face, uh, client interaction. So this is something that um, uh, lots and lots of people have done. Um, my, my own personal experience that was most powerful was um, I used to volunteer with a, a pet therapy service in a hospital's pediatric oncology ward. So we would take the dog around to visit sick kids. Um, the, the kids were, were um, it was pretty tough, uh, often having surgery to remove a tumor or, or for uh, rare um, genetic conditions. And, and so um, the thing I learned, uh, which surprised me was that um, the kids often didn't have the energy to interact with the dog. It, it was often the, the kid's family that, um, wanted so badly for the kid to have a moment of, of relief or joy or, or what it, whatever it might be. And, and what I learned through observation um, was that the, the kid was often humoring their family by, by taking the dog visit. Um, th that wasn't obvious to me in, in the beginning. And um, a, a third, uh, less extreme uh, version of building empathy is um, just reading great literature. You know, um, it, it is uh, almost designed to put you inside of other people's heads and, and um, uh, uh, show you what their experience is like. My, my personal favorite is Dostoevsky. Um, you know, uh, 50 pages go by and then the character gets up out of bed and has a cup of coffee. You know, it's... Uh, um, and and uh, that advice has been validated by social science research. Um, the, the, the third piece, uh, the, the first two are, are uh, more personal opinions in nature. Um, so uh, another question I got was, is it possible that, that funding itself can be marketing? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I have a bias, but I think of it that way. This is why um, you have to do a roadshow for professional investors. You are marketing a piece of your company, and then you are negotiating the value of that piece when you are exchanging equity for funding, right? And, and um, the, the customers that you're selling to, those investors, they often have a lot more experience than you do. And um, it, it can be quite a, a complicated dance in um, uh, both uh, them selling themselves to you as a source of value and uh, you selling the prospect of future investment returns um, to them uh, through the form of expertise, team value, early indicators of market success, uh, and, um, and so forth. Um, what do you think are the most important KPIs to monitor a marketing campaign? Um, I'm going to interpret your question to be a marketing communications campaign. So uh, something like an advertising or a social media campaign. Um, you know, it uh, always begins from the objectives of the campaign. Uh, in my experience, it is um, surprisingly frequent that uh, organizations undertake campaigns without um, sort of taking a stand on what are we trying to accomplish here. And, and of course, um, we'd like to accomplish as many positive things as we can, but um, the way we go about the campaign 
should be driven by what needle we hope the campaign will move. And, and so to me, the, the objectives and the KPI used to measure them are, um, you know, those, those are the first two things you decide before you do anything else. Um, many marketers uh, have trouble um, proving the value of their expenditures. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that. And so what they often end up doing is, is um, they, they look at the uh, efficiency of their spending by considering alternate paths within a campaign and showing that they, they chose one of the more cost-effective paths. Um, so um, I think that covers all the questions in the chat, unless I've missed one. Um, we're at five minutes left. Does anybody want to um, come off mute, jump in and, and respond to anything? Not. I will say something about the literature part. So I totally agree with you. I think that really is how young, like when you're in high school and you're asked to read this stuff and you're like, this has, I don't want to read this. It was written 300 years ago. Um, it really does put you in the mind of a, of a character that most certainly will have some sort of obstacle or problem because that's why you're reading it. And I do think that's a great way to um, develop empathy. My, my high school teacher uh, made me read a lot of James Joyce. And if you knew anything about him, he was incredibly, his characters were incredibly conflicted um, with coming of age and then dealing with Catholicism and Protestantism in, 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 Ire in Ireland. So um, that's my little sign off. Um, if you do not have any more questions, I'd like to thank Dr. Wilbur for his time today and his wonderful presentation. We hope you enjoyed it. And um, if you do have questions, please reach out to us. Our, I can send my, my email at in the chat again, and I think Gerard can do the same. It was here, but we'd love to chat with you. And um, thanks again for coming. And we um, do have more master class um, coming up in the next few months, so please be on the lookout. Uh, thanks, right, Christina, thanks and and thanks everyone for coming. the The only thing I want to share with you is that in eight years at Rady, I have yet to even sniff a teaching award. There is nothing special about me here. Um, our, my colleagues are incredible. Most of them have come out of top 10 and top 20 business schools, and, and they've left faculty positions in those places to come to San Diego to help build up this new, exciting school. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, if it's the right fit for you, I, I love to see you on campus. Um, and, and thanks for making the time. And, and uh, you can confirm those statements over the next handful of master classes. Um, it, it was a real pleasure. Great to meet you guys today. And you, thank you for your wonderful um, display of being humble. Have a good day, everyone.